Okay. So I think about blood donation a lot. And the reason that I spend so much time thinking about it is because we have a critical blood shortage in this country right now where um, healthcare providers are actually having to ration the amount of blood that they give to people and it makes it so that people actually can't get life-saving care that they need. And so when you boil that big problem down into a smaller problem, really the issue is that we don't have enough people donating blood. And so when I wanted to work on my senior project to combat that problem, that led me to my inquiry question. Did I do the next slide? Thank you. How can I create interest in donating blood in my community, especially in the younger generation? And so I volunteer for the Red Cross, and I know that most of the people who do choose to donate are kind of part of the older generations. So that's why I really wanted to target the young, younger generation uh, for this project, because they um, have more time and can impact more people, but they also need to be around to replace the older generations so that our blood supply can keep itself up. So my process can really be broken down into three steps. So we had education, recruitment, and donation. So let's start with education. Um, when we go back to my inquiry question, we're thinking about how can I create interest in donating blood in my community? So the key word is how. Um, so when I was thinking about that, um, the answer that I came up with was education. And so I just figured most people don't know the stark realities of our blood supply. And I figured if I could teach people about that, then they would want to donate. So to show you what I mean, we'll do a little bit of education right now. And when you do the math out on all of that, there would only be 56 days until America ran out of blood. So that means if you started on January 1st, and healthcare providers weren't rationing our blood the way that they are, on February 26th, we'd run out of blood. So it's really important to educate people about this topic. So my challenge, my first challenge, came up really fast when I was trying to educate people because I really wanted to have an assembly kind of like this where I could talk to you guys about the importance of donating blood since um, in-person asks for blood donation are always the most effective. Um, but the assembly uh, didn't work out, so I had to replace it with educational videos. I thought about how else can I get my message across, and that was really the way that I thought was best. And so once I, um, once I figured that out, I had to use one of my skills from FHS, which was effective problem solving via email. Um, I had to email with Ms. Golko and a bunch of teachers to figure out, like, how can I get this message across without an assembly? And I really feel like in my time at FHS, I have conquered email. So that was um, really helpful to me. Once we figured that out, I got my episodes up and running. So you can see some, thumb, some thumbnails from my episodes to teach about the importance of blood donation and why we should all donate. So the next uh, thing that came across, challenge number two, was the viewing of the videos. So we had a hard time um, getting the videos to actually be shown in classrooms. Um, so I had to go around and like talk to teachers specifically and just remind them a little bit. Um, but then kind of the next problem was that um, even if the videos were being shown, I had really no guarantee that students were watching them or paying attention to them, which there really wasn't much I could do to combat that, but it was definitely a challenge that came up. Uh, but I did have some success from my education. Uh, one was student signups, so I did get two signups uh, just from the videos from first-time donors, um, which was really great because I could see that that impacted people. And then I had a second success through my education, which um, I sent my videos over to the middle school because I first learned about blood donation in middle school, and that's when I really became passionate about it. So I really wanted um, younger students to be able to see their teachers donating or um, talk about the importance of blood donation. And I heard back from them that a lot of the students uh, talked about really wanting to donate in the future, which means a lot to me. So now we move on to recruitment. The first thing I did to recruit people was I made these posters. Uh, so the one on the left is for staff and the one on the right is for students because different ages can donate different blood types. 
Um, so I put these up all around the school, and the QR codes that I made brought them directly to the website where they could sign up for my drive. I also did tabling. Um, this was by far the most effective technique that I used. Um, students loved the food. They wanted to come over and eat that. And then we also had money, but they really seemed to want the food and not the money, which was interesting to me. Um, so I filled up all of my remaining spots with this tabling, over 10 spots, in just one lunch on one day. And I got a wait list started, which was really effective. And um, tabling was also a skill that I've learned through FHS. In student government, I had to do a lot of tabling, um, which is not the easiest thing for me to do. So having already had some experience with it definitely made this more successful. And the last thing I did for recruitment was posting. Um, I wasn't planning to post online about my blood drive uh, because when I'd seen that in senior projects in the past, it didn't seem to be particularly effective. But um, I had three appointments drop out the night before my blood drive, and I was really disappointed because I worked really hard to fill all of my spots. And so I posted online and I said, guys, if you're interested in donating, please come. And um, on the left, you can see some messages that I got and people snapped up those spots right away and I got to go back to um, having all my spots filled. So that also worked out. My success in recruitment, the first thing was that um, all my spots were filled, which meant a lot to me. Um, you know, the more people we can have donating, the better. So that was uh, really impactful. And then the second thing that uh, was that we got 15 first-time donors to donate. And where I was really targeting first-time donors and younger donors, it meant a lot to me that um, we had 15 people donating for the first time at my drive. And hopefully they'd continue to do that throughout their life, which would increase our blood supply. Um, the next part is the donation, the actual day of the drive. And I got hit with challenge number one, like, immediately. Um, which was the truck. So the truck with all of the things that they have to bring to take the blood from people uh, was late. It was 75 minutes late, actually. And um, that meant that I had to cancel 14 appointments um, off of my uh, list, which was really disappointing for me because I worked really hard to get those appointments. Some of them were first-time donor appointments. And um, I had a goal to get 30 units of blood collected from people, and missing 14 people really made that seem very impossible. So here you can see um, the picture. That's what the FPAC lobby looked like at 10 AM when my drive was supposed to be starting. But um, we did get up and running. So um, up there you can see me at the check-in table. I brought the tablecloths and the flowers myself. And there's also a health screening area, but I wasn't allowed to take pictures of that for like privacy reasons. Um, and we were making signs, and my goal was really to make a comfortable space for the first-time donors um, where they would be able to ask questions and just, in general, feel comfortable because donating can be a scary experience. Um, and I really do feel like I accomplished that. And then a skill from FHS that I used here was being a blood donor ambassador. So when I joined NHS, I joined the Red Cross as a volunteer. Um, and as a blood donor ambassador, this is job that I do every single time I, I uh, volunteer. I help donors check in. I make them feel comfortable. I answer their questions. And so having all of that under my belt already was really, really, really helpful um, in this project. And here we can see um, some of the people who came to the drive and donated. And so um, these are some familiar faces that you might know. Um, there's Mr. Willett. And um, so that was a pretty, um, it was really successful once we got up and running. And that made, me, um, that made me really happy. And here's some people afterwards enjoying their free food and their snacks and their incentive from the Red Cross, which the Red Cross always has an incentive going on. Um, this month, it was a free beach towel. And I can attest that this one has already been used. So um, <laughs> my success for donation Really, the biggest success of my whole project was that I'm very happy to report here for the very first time that we were able to get our 30 units of blood um, because people came in, people helped out, and um, I was able to reach the goal that they set for Freeport High School, which really, really, really meant a lot to me. Um, over there on the right is all of our blood. Um, that's the boxes that they put it in. And then success number two um, was interest generated. So. My goal at the beginning of this project with my inquiry question was, how can I generate interest in donating? And not only can you see the interest generated by the people that showed up, the 30 
people that showed up, but you can also see it in um, people talked to me after and they were like, oh, I'd love to donate, but I couldn't at that time or I'll sign up in the future. And so that really um, showed me that I was able to generate interest within the younger generation. So I do feel like I successfully met my inquiry question. Um, I'd like to say thank you to a bunch of the people up here. So um, starting with Ms. Jensen, she was my advisor and um, she stood up for me a lot when I was having issues with, you know, how do I get my message across? How can I do this? Where do I have the drive? All that stuff. Uh, Brandon Dyer was my account manager at the Red Cross. He helped me a lot with the, like, blood donation specifics. Um, Mackenzie Mills Dudding, she got me a bunch of donors. She was, like, calling people up after my drive um, got canceled, like, the first 75 minutes. And she was like, I'll get, you know, this person and this person and this person to come. So we really got my goal because of her. I also really want to thank all the donors that came and showed up. Um, not only did you help me finish my project and make this a success, but you helped people's lives, right? 30 units of blood can help save up to 90 people's lives. So just here in this school, we were able to help up to 90 people. Um, Miss Chase at the middle school who got my videos into the middle school, Freeport High School, as well as Ms. Levitt and Ms. Peterson for uh, allowing me to go on the senior project and do this. It means a lot to me. And then my family, mom, dad, Kirk, and Max for uh, supporting me through all of this. Do you have any questions? Yeah, Ms. Levitt. Um, yeah, so the question was, do I have any advice for students next year who would want to take this on as a project? And I think um, my first advice is definitely do it, because no matter what you yield, um, you're definitely going to be helping people. My advice would be to start early. So um, I actually had to contact the Red Cross in February to get my drive on the, on the list. So I didn't really have to do any work between February and now, but I did have to reach out early, so I would make sure that you do that. Any other questions? Sure. The question was, do I plan to host more drives in the future? And yes, absolutely I do. Um, that's one of the reasons that I wanted to do this as a senior project in a little bit more of a structured environment was so that I could um, have the skills in the future. I definitely anticipate doing it in college and maybe beyond. Yes, Enoch. Good question. Uh, volunteering or running the drive? OK. Um, the question was, how did, I get in the, in the, how did I get in contact with the Red Cross to start volunteering? So for volunteering as my blood donor ambassador, uh, you have to actually apply for that job. So I, I called and I applied and I emailed and all that. To get the drive set up, um, they have like a, a page on their website where you can just like submit a little request. And um, I did that in February. Yes. Um, the question was, what was my most successful recruitment tactic? And it was definitely the tabling. Um, I was in trouble with not having filled enough of my spots. And I literally, like I said, I tabled for one lunch one day. Like, it was just lunch A. And um, I filled over 10 spots. So it was definitely that. Yeah, Lily. Um, the question was, how did I first get interested in blood donation? And... I really got interested because um, I wanted to know what my blood type was. <laughs> and then um, once I donated for the first time and I found out how much you can actually help people through donating, I wanted to continue doing that. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.
All right. Hello, my name is Carly Ponto, and my project is Golf Cart Renovation. So the goals for this project, as you can see, this is our original golf cart we have here. I'm going to paint it. I'm going to put on a lift kit. I'm also going to make it street legal by adding horn, mirrors, and turn signals. And this is my grandparents' golf cart. So they picked out colors and everything that they wanted on this golf cart. So my goals were to meet their expectations and make them happy. This is my beautiful grandparents right here on another golf cart we have. Here are some examples of some past golf carts that my father has actually done in the past. This red one right here is also owned by my grandparents that we keep up my, at my camp where this golf cart will also go. So that one, you can see the seats and the roof are going to kind of sort of match what I did with this new golf cart. But all, as you can see, they're all painted. They all have a lift kit. So that's what I'm going to be doing. So the first step of this process was to take apart the golf cart completely. We took off the seats, the bumpers, pretty much anything that you could remove, we did remove. As you can see, it was incredibly dirty, so we had to wash it. I don't even think I washed it well enough because it came back to haunt me later. But then this sticker down here, we had to peel that off very painstakingly. That was probably the first hard challenge we faced in this project. We went out and bought paint. We went with a fluorescent green. We wanted lime green. We could not find it, so we found the closest match we could. We filled any dents or scrapes that we had in the body so that we could paint it. We sanded the whole cart so that it was smooth and also a little roughed up so that the paint would actually stick. And then we taped off any edges that we didn't want paint to get on. Challenges with this, taking apart, we had some rusty nuts and bolts, so it was kind of difficult to get it apart, and the sticker and dirt, of course, were issues. The painting process. So we painted the body and the roof. The roof we did black on the inside and then the green on the top. Now the issue came into here with the fluorescent green paint. It did not cover anything. It was completely see-through, so any spots we filled, any dings in the golf cart, shone right through when we painted it. So what we had to do is we took a darker green paint and painted over any edge that had a spot. Then we went in with this spring green and did a coat over the entire cart and the entire roof. And then we went in with the fluorescent green that you see on the final cart. This paint was horrible to work with. It separated, so the color, you would get a really bright streak and then you would get a really dark streak. And so we had to try and make it as even as possible. I think it turned out great. I had never spray painted anything before, so this was a big learning curve for me. If you get one spot too wet, it starts dripping. So I had to learn how to sand it down and fix my mistakes, because there were quite a lot of them. Another big challenge with painting is it was so windy the week we decided to do it that dirt would just get onto the cart and stick to the paint. So what we had to do is go into this little shed, I don't know if you can tell up here, keep the door open, put some masks on, and we managed to get it painted. Oh. Then we also put tire shine on all of the other parts so that it looked nice and shiny after we cleaned it, and it looks brand new when we put it together. Now the seat covers, these were nice and easy, you just staple them right on, they came from the factory. However, the challenge came when it came to this seat. This is the front bottom seat, and it was completely rotted, the wood was. So we had to get those handlebars out that you can see, and the bolts were just spinning freely, the nuts were. So we had to take out some bolt cutters and cut them free. We ended up actually with the bolt cutters because that's how awful the bolts were to get out. But we managed to take it off, and we also took off this plastic part and ordered a completely new seat and put the cover on that and put the handles on that because it would not have screwed into the rotten seat. Then we got all the seat covers on everything else. I had also never used a staple gun before, so that was a learning curve. I was pretty bad at it at the beginning. We had to hammer the staples in because they would not go in far enough, but the seats turned out well. The color doesn't match exactly, but on the cart, on the finished cart, it looks really nice. Then we did the lift kit. So this is the most complicated part, in my opinion. The first step, we did the front. We had to jack it up completely. And there was a lot of pieces that go into the front lift kit, but the most notable one 
is this. This is called the, oh, crap. I forgot what it's called. <laughs> it's, but, there you go. This part right here where it had to screw in, it was too small so it didn't fit. So the instructions actually said to take a half inch drill bit and screw it. However, that made it too big. So it didn't fit exactly right. It's a little loose, but we contacted the manufacturers. They sent us an extra piece. So we'll go in and replace that, but it drives perfectly fine without it. It was just a minor setback. The, then we went on to the back. As you can see, the axle here, this used to be above this leaf spring. So we moved the leaf spring to the top, put on this little block, which provided the lift. The complication with that is you had to jack up the motor because it was supported by nothing. The ground wire, however, on the motor was not long enough to move the axle to the bottom, so we had to actually cut the ground wire and replace that later. Then we put on the new wheels and aligned it. This rod right here, you're supposed to be able to spin it freely to line the cart, just adjust it quickly. However, everything on this cart was completely rusted, so we could not align that. So we had to take apart the front lift kit a little bit, get that rod out so that we could get it spinning freely. Then we moved on to the wiring. So for it to be street legal, we had to have some certain things. We had to have brake lights, headlights, blinkers. I'm not sure if hazards are required for it to be street legal, but it came with the kit, and then also a horn. So all of these wires were just connected into one big thing that we fed through the cart all the way back to the taillights and to the headlights. We secured it with a bunch of zip ties. But right here, you can see we have a blue wire here and a blue wire here. This was a manufacturing issue. One of the blue wires was for hazards, one of them was for headlights, and we could not figure out which was which. So we ended up blowing a lot of fuses trying to figure out this, but we got it together, it all works. We secured the blinker switch thing to the steering wheel, so that operates the headlights, blinkers, horn, everything. The brake lights, we had a brake pad that we screwed onto the brake, so when you press it, the brake lights come on. And I learned a fun way to connect wires here. And yeah. Oh, another challenge we had, the terminals that connected to the battery were too small. So we had to cut those off and put on new terminals. We actually ended up knocking off a terminal from one of the existing wires. So we also had to replace that one. But it ended up OK. This is where the dirt from earlier really came back to haunt me because we were working under the cart and it was not clean and it was raining dirt on your face. Finishing touches, we added some armrests onto the back seats with some nice cup holders. I think it was a really nice touch. We also added this mirror, which is required for it to be street legal. It's a little shaky driving, but it still works. We also added these really fun lights and so the sticky part of the lights we put on the sides. And then in the front, we just ended up tying it around this bar with some zip ties. It worked perfectly. And then we secured the switch to the lights onto the uh, blinker thing with some Velcro. The lights are really cool. In this picture, they're green because it matches the cart, but they don't always have to be green. We can change it to whatever we want. Some skills I learned from FHS. Engineering class, I took three years of engineering. Ms. Goodspeed taught me how to use pretty much every tool that I've used in this project. I also took AP Physics this year, and I was shocked at how much uh, of my knowledge I used with my simple machines, uh, mechanical advantage, torque, all of that came into play, which I didn't expect, and also public speaking with Ms. Blyer. Some takeaways. Hands-on hands -on projects are definitely my speed. I enjoyed going out, getting to work, much more than sitting down and doing some research. My dad and my grandfather are incredible. I could not have done this project alone. He called off work to come help me. I could, like the lift kit was impossible for me to do. So I really couldn't have done it without them. I'm really grateful to them. I would do something like this as a career. I'm going into the engineering field next year. And this is kind of engineering related, but it's a lot more hands-on. So this is definitely something that I'm interested in pursuing. This taught me the importance of communication. I had a lot of teachers to email. 
I had my grandparents to talk to about what they wanted me to do with the cart. So I learned a lot of skills and sent a lot of emails with communication. And I have a huge respect for mechanics now. This was hard work. After every time I went outside, I would be covered in dirt. I had grime under my fingernails, and I would be absolutely exhausted. So I have a huge respect. My thank yous, Ms. Hunter, my project advisor. My father, once again, calling off work. He was a superhero for this project. My grandparents, my pop-up, thank you for coming over. And thank you guys for allowing me to do this project and trusting me with your golf cart. Ms. Peterson and Ms. Levitt for organizing senior projects. And FHS for the opportunity. Any questions? Yes. Oh, the question was, what am I building next? And the answer is, I have no idea. Whenever a project comes to me, I'll take it, though. Yes. So this project kind of came about when my dad did the first golf cart for camp. And so we had one really beautiful golf cart and then that other one, which is not as beautiful. And my grandparents wanted it to be done anyway. And I said, hey, I have senior projects coming up. I will take that opportunity. Yes. So the question was, how fast can it go? And also, where are we planning to drive this on streets? So it goes about as fast as a normal golf cart. We didn't really adjust anything like that. Um, it is under 25 miles an hour, which is why it doesn't need seatbelts to be street legal. But where we're planning on driving it, up at my camp, up at those roads, and my grandparents are also maybe planning on taking it up to their house and driving on their road. Any other questions? 